Who doesn't love a good survival story? In this video, I'll be sharing three of the most amazing and incredible desert survival stories. What's going on guys? If you're in the mood for some unbelievable stories, then you're in the right place. My name's Derek and this channel is dedicated to all kinds of crazy stories that are absolutely 100% true. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, don't make today a one and done. Hit the like button, the subscribe button, and the notification bell and join me each week for new unbelievable stories. Now that that's done, let's get into the good stuff with today's stories. Aaron's survival story begins April 26, 2003, when he was hiking all by himself in Blue John Canyon, which is located in Canyonlands National Park in southeastern Utah. On this particular day, Aaron was carrying a small bag containing one liter of water, a couple of burritos, and some chunks of chocolate. Can't forget the chocolate! He also had a cheap multi-tool kit with him. Some other things he had were headphones and a video camera, but he didn't have a cell phone and it wouldn't have done him any good anyways because the desolate area he was in had no reception. Before heading to the canyon alone, Aaron hadn't told anyone where he was going or what he was going to be doing. He was climbing the narrow canyons alone, which he did have a lot of experience doing. He negotiated a 10 foot drop and accidentally dislodged a boulder that he thought was stable. He fell down a few feet and then he saw the boulder coming right at him. He put his hands up to try to push himself away and the boulder crushed his lower right arm. He was stuck in the canyon with his right hand and lower arm crushed under the huge boulder. In a rage fueled by adrenaline, he said he cursed like a pirate for 45 minutes. Can you really blame him? He drank some of his water and then he forced himself to stop because he realized that the water was the only thing that was going to keep him alive. And no matter how hard he tried and how much force he used, he couldn't free his arm from the 800 pound boulder. He was stuck in the wilderness of the canyon all by himself with just a few items and no way to call or reach anyone for help. He thought through his options and he ruled out the most drastic one, which was suicide. The other option that came to him was to cut his arm off. After days spent chipping away at the boulder with his knife with no success, he put the knife to his arm but realized it was too blunt to even cut his body hair. But he knew what he needed to do and he took the blunt knife and he pierced his arm skin but of course ran into solid bone. And at that point, he thought there was no way he'd be able to amputate his arm and save his life. On day five, he found peace in knowing that that was it. He was going to die there and this could very well be his final resting place. He took his hand and he brushed some grit off his trapped thumb and it caused some of the flesh on his thumb to peel right off. So he took his knife and he poked his thumb with it and the knife went right into his thumb like a hot knife through butter. Gases escaped from his thumb because his hand was decomposing and he could smell the disgusting and putrid decay. This sent him into a fit of rage and he tried to forcefully rip his arm from the rock. While doing so, he felt his arm bend and it clicked with him that, hey, I can use the boulder, the object that's trapping me, to break the bones in my arm. So he began hurling himself against the boulder until he successfully broke his radius and ulna bones. From there, it was smooth sailing. He took his blunt knife and he was able to cut through the remaining skin and tendons and finally free himself. However, he still wasn't in the clear. He was still alone and he was many miles away from civilization with a wound that he could very easily bleed to death from. He made a tourniquet using pieces of his climbing kit. He strapped himself to his ropes and was somehow able to scale a 70 foot cliff and escape from the canyon. Not long after doing this, three Dutch tourists found him, gave him water and helped him before he was found by a search and rescue helicopter that his family had dispatched. Even after this whole ordeal, Aaron still enjoys activities in the outdoors, but now he makes sure he has family or friends with him. His experience hasn't kept him from the canyon where all of this happened. In fact, he still visits the boulder that crushed and trapped him years ago. And as far as the severed portion of his arm, park rangers retrieved it following Aaron's rescue. It took 13 rangers, a hydraulic jack, and a winch to remove the 800 pound boulder. The arm was cremated and returned to Aaron, and six months later when he turned 28 years old, he returned to the Slot Canyon and scattered the ashes. His story was later made into a documentary called 127 Hours. 
On April 10th, 1994, 39-year-old retired Italian police officer Mauro Prosperi set off with a friend to complete the Marathon des Sables. The race is an ultra-marathon that's 156 miles long in the very extreme environment of the Sahara Desert. This event has been called the toughest race on Earth. Mauro was looking forward to it. He was excited to challenge himself, and he prepared for this extreme event by running 40 kilometers each day and reducing his water intake so that he could acclimate his body to the feeling of dehydration. His wife had her concerns with him competing in such an extreme event, but he told her everything was going to be just fine and that he was going to be able to complete the event. This was Mario's first desert event, which his friend Manzo was also doing, as well as 134 other runners. Considering how long the race was and the environment it was in, participants were required to carry their own food, clothing, compass, sleeping bag, portable stove, and also an emergency kit with a signal flare. So Mauro had all of these items on him in his backpack. Water was going to be given to runners at different checkpoints along the race, and Mauro had a very small amount of water on him. After three days, Maro and Manzo covered 60 miles of salt bed, sand, and rock terrain. The fourth day was the longest leg of the race, which was 53 miles. And by the early afternoon, Maro had picked up his pace and left his friend Manzo behind. The brutal 115 degree Fahrenheit heat was beating down on Maro, who was now in fourth place. The desert winds picked up, and in an effort to increase his pace, he started cutting across small sand dunes. The winds continued picking up and developed into a full-on sandstorm. Needless to say, Mauro had a hard time seeing as he was being hit with extreme wind and sand, but he was determined to continue the race and he ran for the entire length of the eight-hour storm. When the storm passed, he stopped to rest and shelter in. The following morning, the winds had stopped. He ran for four hours and was hoping to find other competitors along the way, but he didn't see anyone. He later realized that the signs and landmarks that marked off the race trail had completely disappeared with the storm. He had very little water left, so he began urinating in his spare water bottle and drinking it. Around sunset, he saw a low-flying helicopter flying in his direction. His first thought was that it was searching for him, and so to try and get the pilot's attention, he fired a small signal flare in the air. Unfortunately, the flare went unnoticed by the pilot and the helicopter flew off. The next day, he continued on, hoping to find shade and water. After hours of walking, he came upon a vacant Muslim shrine, but he was disappointed to see that the shrine had long been abandoned. Maro used the shrine as a shelter, and he hoped to be found there, and while staying there, he rationed the small amount of food he had in his backpack, and he cooked it with fresh urine on his portable stove. To hydrate himself, he continued drinking his urine, and he also sucked moisture from wet wipes in his backpack, and he licked dew from rocks. He discovered a colony of bats above the shrine, and he used them for nourishment by sucking their blood and eating their raw insides. Over the next couple of days, he was able to find and eat bird eggs, beetles, and lizards near the shrine. After Mara was unable to get the attention of a second plane flying overhead, he used a piece of charcoal to write a farewell message to his family. He took his pocket knife and he cut his wrists, hoping to end his life, because he believed that he would never be found and that he was just going to die a slow and painful death in the desert. After cutting his wrists, he laid down and he awaited an overnight death. However, he woke up the next morning to only a small amount of blood on his wrists. Because of how shallow the cuts on his wrists were and how badly he was dehydrated, the blood in his veins had clotted, and this gave him the determination to carry on with the hope of being rescued. So he continued on and traveled only during the cooler temperatures of the day and night. In the evenings, he'd submerge himself in sand pits that he dug to try and stay cool. Eight days after disappearing, he found an oasis that contained a puddle of water. He tried drinking the water, but it was extremely difficult because of how swollen his mouth and throat were from dehydration. The next morning, he filled his water bottle and continued on. As he journeyed, he stumbled upon fresh goat droppings that led to human footprints. He saw a young girl tending to goats and immediately ran towards her begging for help. This scared the young girl and she ran away screaming, disappearing over a sand dune. She later returned with her grandma and they led Maro to their camp and they served him food and drink, but he was unable to digest the food and he threw up. The men of the camp loaded Maro onto a camel and took him to the nearest village, which was several hours away. 
After arriving at the village, Mara was turned over to military police who believed he was a spy. He was blindfolded and interrogated. After he was properly identified, he was taken to a hospital. In all, Mauro had wandered an astonishing 180 miles off the ultramarathon course and had unknowingly crossed the Moroccan border into Algeria. He stayed at the infirmary for seven days, where he called his wife, who had believed he was dead. Mauro had lost 33 pounds, weighing in at only 99 pounds, and he required 16 liters of IV fluids to replenish all the water he lost from dehydration. His liver suffered severe damage, and he wasn't able to digest food. For months, he was only able to eat soups, liquids, and food ground up by a blender. It took Mauro almost two years to fully recover, though his organs experienced permanent damage. In 2012, nearly 20 years after the entire ordeal, Mauro re-entered the Marathon des Sables, the same ultramarathon that almost took his life and successfully completed it. Ricky McGee was driving down an isolated road on his way to a new job on January 24, 2006, when he believes three Aboriginal men hijacked his car, drugged him, and dumped him in the middle of the Australian outback. Now, if you aren't aware, the outback is one of the most unforgiving environments on the planet, and it's definitely not a place you want to realize you're alone in. He woke up unaware of where he was and what he was doing there, and he was confused because dingoes, which are wild dogs in Australia, were scratching at him while he laid in a shallow grave. Little did Ricky know that this was just the beginning of a 70-day struggle for survival to make it out of the Australian outback alive. For the next nearly two and a half months, Ricky walked through the harsh and desolate terrain in bare feet, and the more he walked, the more he believed he was getting closer to being found, but he later realized that that type of thinking was flawed. He had no food with him, but luckily for him, the outback is home to leeches, grasshoppers, lizards, snakes, frogs, insects, and a variety of different plants, and Ricky consumed all of these things in order to stay alive. He was able to find a dam to stay hydrated, and he built a shelter there out of branches and leaves, which became his home for the next several weeks. In the evenings, he barricaded his shelter with rocks to keep dingoes and any other predators from trying to eat him as he slept. And luckily for him, staying hydrated wasn't too difficult because it was the middle of the wet season and the dam provided sufficient water. It was near the shelter that he made that cattle station workers found him alive but severely malnourished. He looked like a skeleton and his skin was very dark from blistering exposure to the sun. Ricky had gone from 230 pounds to 106 pounds, losing more than half of his body weight. He was taken to a hospital and treated for severe dehydration and malnutrition. After a few days there, his condition greatly improved and he was able to finally go home. Police were never able to locate his car and they never found anything suggesting that a crime had been committed. For those reasons, authorities were skeptical of his story and mystery surrounds what exactly happened to him. Well guys, that will do it for today's stories. Thanks again for joining me, and if you'd like to join me for more stories like this, make sure you subscribe. Also, if you have a story suggestion for a future video, I'd love to hear it. Feel free to drop it in the comments below, or email it to me at the email address in the description. Stay happy, stay healthy, and I'll see you in the next one.